everyone, and thank you for attending this webinar of KPMG and Vector AI on the nation state threat and what you can do about it for your organization. My name is Marta Steegijs. I'm a senior consultant at KPMG Cyber, and today I will be the host of this webinar. I have a background in working in information security at the Dutch Marine Corps and creating detection and response approaches for national cyber securities with KPMG security centers. Uh, with me today are Marcel van Kaam from KPMG and John Mancini and John O'Callaghan uh, from now on, whom I will refer to as JC to avoid any awkward moments from Vector AI. And before uh, these gentlemen will introduce themselves, uh, we have some practicalities for today. So the webinar will last about one hour, of which 50 minutes uh, will be a panel discussion, and we have 10 minutes reserved for questions. So if you have any questions, please uh, ask them in the Q&A chat module in your screen, and we'll be happy to address them at the end of the webinar. We also have some small questions in a poll panel uh, that we'd love for you to fill out. Uh, this is an event for more experienced people with nation state threats, but also for those that are completely new to it. So we would love to hear some more about who we're talking with. And during the webinar, we'll not only discuss examples of nation state attacks, but we also elaborately dissect an example of an actual nation state attack that was detected and stopped by Vector AI. So I would say you want to stay on for that to hear about this attack and how the information that we'll share with you can be recognized there. So with that said, let's start with some introductions of the panel. So uh, gentlemen, could you please introduce yourself? So what do you do and what your background is? Uh, starting with Marcel. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Marcel van Kaam. I work in security for about 18 years now. Uh, as a little background, I used to work for the military and uh, intelligence agencies. And currently, I work as a senior manager at the cybersecurity department of APMG, where I help clients to understand the risk exposure from cyber and espionage threats and oversee uh, larger cybersecurity transformation programs. Thank you, Marcel. And can you share a little bit more about what KPMG does in the nation state and cyber area? Uh, yes, of course. So we help clients to understand the risk, risk exposure, uh, to determine what the actual risks are um, and how to mitigate those with the help of cybersecurity implementation, but also with uh, the help of, for example, uh, travel security uh, programs. All right. Thank you very much. Then, John, could you go next, please? Hi all, John Mancini here. Uh, I manage a portion of Vectra's threat detection functionality. Um, Vectra, it, for those that don't know, we're basically a leading uh, vendor in the space for creating AI-driven threat detection. Um, we have patented threat detection capabilities that we refer to as attack signal intelligence um, that's been able to basically prioritize threats from public cloud attacks, SaaS attacks, identity attacks, network attacks, all from one single platform. We've got a long history of detecting APT threats and studying their tactics. So that, that kind of is part of my background that I bring to this conversation. A little bit about me kind of on the personal level. Uh, I started off as a data scientist developing threat detection algorithms to find the different behaviors that attackers execute as they progress their attacks. Uh, I went from kind of building those algorithms myself to leading a portion of their team to then taking kind of a more supervisor role over a larger portion of that detection function. All right. Thank you, John. Very interesting. Uh, JC, last but not least. Thank you very much and good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the call. Um, so I'm with Vector AI just over a year, um, so relatively new to the cybersecurity industry, but I've been in the IT industry for a long, long time, as you can tell from my hairstyle. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm not here. I work in the product marketing team uh, in, in Vector, but um, my main purpose here today is uh, basically to talk about my experience. Uh, with nation state attacks. So kind of hands up anybody who's been a victim of a nation state attack. <laughs> yeah, there we go, right? Um, so <laughs> later on, um, I'll discuss my experience. Uh, I was working with SolarWinds uh, when they suffered a, a, a compromise and breach, uh, which was well documented, but we'll go into more detail on that uh, later on. Yeah, so, so thank, you, thank you, JC. Thank you. Very interesting indeed to hear about your experience and for the audience that will not even be the actual example that we will discuss. So you have more examples to come. Uh, so with these introductions done, let's uh, dive into the topics for the discussion. To start with, our, uh, yeah, we want to start with the basics. So who are we really talking about when we're speaking of nation state threat actors? And before I ask the panel also about this, I think it's important to mention the rules of the game that we apply here. So we will not discuss specific nation state threat actors, so the APT 
entities or countries in this call. Uh, these threats really depend on the organization at hand and also require a tailor-based assessment uh, to really see what applies to an organization. So we welcome you to contact us if you want to discuss this in more depth, but within the webinar we will stay more on the general uh, course for that. So Marcel, can you tell us a bit about the nation state threat actors? Yes, um, well, nation state attackers, uh, they are individuals or they are groups uh, and they get support from governments. Uh, basically, they work on behalf of an intelligence agency and the main goal is to promote their country's strategic interest by carrying out cyber attacks, but also espionage operations. So it can differ a bit per nation what their interest is on a strategic level, but basically it boils down to either gaining uh, economic advantage, enhancing their military capabilities, or increase their political influence. Uh, and, and you just explained uh, shortly about APTs, or Advanced Persistent Threats. I think it's good to mention here that APTs are more uh, uh, connected to uh, uh, the cyber teams or the hacking teams that work for uh, in intelligence agencies. And at the same time, uh, those agencies can deploy multiple uh, 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 operations, which, which we will dive into later on. Uh, but in general, intelligence agencies, they, they prefer to work in secrecy, of course, and uh, they aim to remain anonymous uh, and deny any involvement. Or at least, for what I know from, from the past, is at least you have some plausible deniability. Um, so what, what do they do? Eh? They, they guard intelligence, of course, but they also sabotage targets. They steal intellectual property or, or trade secrets. Uh, but we also see uh, that they conduct influence campaigns and, and disrupt uh, several services. Um, and they can do that because, in general, those groups have significant resources at their disposal, uh, including uh, advanced technical capabilities, but also large funding. All right. Thank you, Marcel. And if you look at these motivations, do you think that that's one that's the most applied? Um, well, that, that, that's a good question, but that, that depends a little bit on, on their intention. So uh, uh, if, if, if it's about uh, uh, political uh, decision making, they, they want to monitor that. And of course, it's political influence. But uh, at the same time, we see specifically for corporate, that there is a lot of intention and, and pretty aggressive intention to uh, gain and steal intellectual property. Basically, they want to uh, earn money from from your secrets uh, that, that is what mm -hmm. we see a lot at the moment yes okay thank you i think a very important topic also for the audience here so we'll also dive a little bit deeper into that later um and as you indicated uh, marcel these actors really have a strong desire to stay anonymous i think indeed for obvious reasons uh, but john how can you then know that you're dealing with a nation state threat actor during an attack frankly you won't know um because in the end of the day, these attackers, these nation states, they look and will behave just like any cyber gang out there. It's very, very hard and to a certain degree, almost unnecessary to chase attribution in the first pass of a cyber attack. Fundamentally, you know, as, as kind of my colleague was going through here, these attackers are after IP, they're after big organizations, they are after pathways actually into organizations that can be brokered through supply chains into other organizations. Any attacker, be it a nation state, be a hacker gang, has those same motivations in the end of the day. The difference may be kind of coming back to that funding piece, they may have a little bit more money to spend on their tactics. They may have a few new bells and whistles, but fundamentally, the things they have to do to progress their attack are the same. So in this sense, identifying whether it's a nation state or a cyber gang, it's a toss up and you can do it. It's not impossible. There's clues that the attackers will leave behind, gaps in their OPSEC, things like the leak. You know, they're only active at a certain time frame that's very tightly associated with a country. They leave behind a certain piece of malware, things like Trulia or Snake malware were associated with a very particular nation state as of lately. But it, it kind of been taking a step back from saying, you know, how do you attribute or can you attribute? How do you know? It's why would you, do you really need to do that? Do you need to focus your resources on being able to do that? And the answer is no. Ultimately, the defenders need to be able to focus on stopping them outright, sure. rather they are a ransomware gang, a cyber gang, and nation state, these attacks just need to be stopped. That's the, the main focus any defender should have. 
Thank you, John. I think very interesting uh, indeed. Uh, I can imagine to the audience it might sound a bit counterintuitive if you're not looking uh, for attribution, but indeed there are so many motives out there um, that is more about the perspective of what can you do about it instead of who done it. Uh, so I think that also ties into our next topic, because if you want to do something about it, you also need to know, of course, why you're an interesting target to nation state threat actors. So if we go to our second topic, uh, talking about the targets and, and who these uh, threat actors go for. Um, Marcel, you already talked a bit about the motives of these actors. So can you tie these into the kind of organizations that nation state actors target? Sure. Um, um, well, nowadays you might wonder who isn't of interest of nation states. So as John uh, said earlier, uh, that attribution is very difficult at the moment, but at the same time we see there's by for, for nation states, there's a lot of interest. Uh, but if you consider the strategic goals of these nations, uh, political influence, economic advance, or the military capability, if we dive into increasing political influence, we, we see that nation state attackers focus on government departments. However, when it comes to economic advantage, uh, and, and we're looking basically at the theft of intellectual property, um, for the audience, uh, some sectors will come to no surprise. Uh, think of um, state actors, actors that focus on research institutions, such as universities or laboratories, uh, think tanks. Uh, but we also see a lot of uh, activity in biotechnology. So think of uh, uh, disease treatments like we saw at COVID-19, uh, but also the, the uh, operations within pharmaceuticals, um, semiconductor industry or the automotive industry is also a very uh, relevant topic that, that is being exploited today. Uh, and the same accounts for the defense industry, uh, which is covering maritime, space, and aviation technology. And there is a specific interest uh, in, in radar and optics and, and communication and naval systems. In, in any way, uh, what, what is really important to and, and I see that at clients a lot is that, um, uh, uh, yeah, but this is a, a, a high manufacturing or high performance uh, problem. Only those industries uh, suffering from uh, nation states. And that, that actually doesn't need, ha doesn't have to be the case. Um, for example, we, we saw that uh, Dupont, which is a chemical firm that produces paint, was also targeted by a nation state a couple of years ago. And this was about uh, the, the recipe that they used for the color paint, uh, or the color white in, in, in paint. It's, and and that, that got stolen. So they saw that an engineer that was working at Dupont was found guilty by stealing the, the recipe for the color white in paint and sold that to a foreign country. And, and by doing that, he received about $20 million from that nation state, whereas oh, wow. the, that same government uh, was accused of instructing its industry to, to duplicate this, uh, this, this recipe. Um, and and uh, just to put this in figures, uh, Dupont owns about 20% of the market. And, and this particular recipe just for the color white is worth about $17 billion annually in global sales. So that, that, that's significant. Wow. Yeah, and, and this is just one part, right? So, so we're only talking about intellectual property. When it comes, for example, to sabotage, we see that cyber attacks pose also a significant danger for specifically the vital infrastructure. I think of power grids, communication systems, um, and railways. Uh, and we all know that disruptions of these systems can cause social disruption and, and economic damage. However, I, when I look at these kind of attacks, I see a change of intent um, in recent attacks uh, when it comes to this critical infrastructure. I now see a trend where nation states are actually starting to announce to give their intelligence agencies um, uh, approval and more freedom to retaliate uh, and that the government is willing to take more risks if, if deemed necessary. I, this morning, this actually happened. Uh, in in uh, what's it, in Rotterdam in, in in the Dutch Harbor this morning, um, this morning. and that's concerning. Th this yeah, this morning just saw this uh, about uh, uh, earlier today, uh, but the Rotterdam Harbor was attacked by by uh, state actors, or at least mm -hmm. uh, uh, an, uh, an attack that is that is linked to a state actor, um, just because uh, out of retaliation and and. In general, this is concerning because this trend is likely to increase the amount of cyber attacks and reckless behavior in the, in the future. 
All right, thank you, uh, Marcel. And also interesting to hear a very current example indeed. Um, so I think if you put everything together, you see that in essence, everyone is a very interesting target for state actors. Uh, but the shift you mentioned from sabotage to, towards sabotage and retaliation, I think is especially with the geopolitical conflicts rising, a very uh, good one to take into account. Uh, so thank you for these insights. And uh, I think we've now heard who we're talking about when we're talking about national state actors, but also who they target and for what purposes. So let's now dive a bit deeper into the actual nuts and bolts, so the operations that they actually apply, talking about the what. So I know that most people here also in the audience are probably familiar with tactics used by nation states in the past, such as spare phishing or phishing in general, malware, or DDoS attacks. And I think we can maybe put aside those for now and focus a bit on the modes of brandy that are gaining popularity. Um, so John, can you take us through some of these? Yeah, I think, you know, I'll, I'll kind of preface any statement I say by, you know, in order to go into the full set of operations these ethnic groups are using, uh, that's a full other webinar uh, and several <laughs> books at this point. So I'll, I'll try to focus on some of the highlight yeah. reel here. That's um, why I said anyone, so, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. If anyone is interested, though, in really taking a deep dive, again, you know, my point before that these threat actors out there that are associated with nation states are using the same techniques that every cyber gang out there is using. Maybe some slight bells and whistles on them, but fundamentally they're the same techniques. And that drives back to using frameworks like MITRE ATT&CK to really understand the landscape of what it is that attackers do out there so that you kind of can get that holistic view of all the tactics. Because fundamentally, any of these attackers you know, yes, they have to find a way in. And, you know, while, you know, these are the classic ways, there still remain the same ways of using phishing, of using zero days to get into an environment. But once they're in, I mean, the set of tactics, you know, they still need to progress. They need command and control. They need discovery. They need to do lateral movement. They need credential access. And eventually they will move towards impact and exfiltration. Those tactics are universal in these threats that we're seeing active out there. But in terms of things that are, are new in this space or are really worth calling out is activity that we're seeing in the cloud. So things related to credentials that are stolen, either as a starting point for an attack or in the progression of a network attack through the cloud. So things like Azure AD become heavy targets right now for these nation states because they provide fundamental access into things like AWS, into Azure, and into things like M365, where email data, things like this are, are heavy, heavy targets for these threat actors out there. What's critical, though, in that kind of view of the cloud being an attack surface and this progression on the network is fundamentally prevention is going to fail when these threat actors are really active in their attacks. Stopping them isn't about stopping basically them only at that phishing incident level, only at that initial access level. It's about having the right set of tripwires, the right set of fail safes for when your prevention does fail. And there's a lot of ways because this attack surface is so big now for it to fail that you have visibility into what they do because there's just so many things they can do. And it gives you as a defender a lot of opportunities to actually detect them because there is so many things they do do. All right. Thank you, John. Very interesting. Marshall, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I, I agree with John uh, that, uh, that many attacks are highly advanced. Um, but I also want, want to point out that, that many companies are still not very well prepared when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, and, and, and yeah, well, uh, from my own experience, at least, that I work at the penetration team. And, and in general, I, I do in, indeed, like, yeah, like John also mentioned, I, I see a lot of organization that, that are lacking basic cybersecurity practices. Uh, and I just have, there's one hacker in my team, he, he's called Ruben, and I can just look at him uh, when, he's, when he's doing a penetration test and, and just at his face, I already know that, okay, so this is a client that, that uh, has difficulties with managing identities and access and segmenting uh, its network because uh, th that, that's a very easy uh, attack to exploit. Um, and in, in general, I see this particularly being coming through in the operational technology environments. Um, I come across uh, larger organizations that, that basically still today are uh, only now starting to prioritize uh, cybersecurity. 
And uh, um, for, as, as an example, so recently we worked at a for a research uh, project together with uh, the Rappout uh, University in the Netherlands. And, and we saw that uh, uh, several components of industrial control systems, which are used in uh, critical infrastructure, are not secure, uh, not, not by design, but also not how they are configured by the, uh, by the administrators or the end users. And uh, basically, we saw that a significant number of, of these devices are connected to the internet. Uh, many of them poorly configured from the beginning. Um, and if you, I had to remind about a, a, a report from Microsoft, um, but also reports that we saw from the intelligence agencies that, that states that vulnerabilities are being exploited by nation state attackers with, within 40 days. Whereas I, when I come to uh, organizations, uh, they they need more than 200 days to, to fix the vulnerability. So that, that's a big gap. That is indeed a big gap. John, can you uh, agree with that? Is that something you see as well? Yeah, I, I mean, this comes back to my last point on, on prevention is, is, is destined to fail. Like you can't, you can't keep up with all these vulnerabilities. It's no fault to the, the IT teams responsible for them. It's a hard, hard task to do. And it's just a function of, okay, if you take the tactic that yes, you're gonna invest in, in prevention, we'll talk about that in I think a, a kind of a next few slides, but it's just, it's not enough to say that that's the only thing that's going to stop these these folks, and it's not the best option to say that that that's how you stop them. No, thanks for that. I think uh, indeed it's important to see that you need to have both your preventative security in order, but also being able to detect quickly if something is wrong, if that's being evaded, and how can you then act as fast as possible to prevent further damage. Um, I think also it's interesting in that sense to look at supply chain attacks. Um, where we also see these vulnerabilities that we talked about being exploited to uh, well, multiple targets at once. And of course, we already heard at the beginning that we have JC amongst us who has lived through the solar winds attack. So can you maybe tell us a bit more about the operations of the attackers during that attack, JC? Sure. Um, I suppose, first of all, let's, let's consider why solar winds, right? So why do they target solar winds to, um, to achieve their, 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 their aims? Um, Solomons was, you know, a small to mid-sized organization, 2,000 people, 2,500 people, um, but they had a very good network monitoring product, NPM was the name of the product, and it was, uh, you know, the market leader, um, and it was ubiquitous across a lot of people who use network monitoring, right? Um, and they were very, very strong in the federal government, uh, US federal government in environments. So essentially the, uh, the nation state kind of identified Solomons uh, who had a product which was um, being well used in, in U.S. defense environments and U.S. government agencies and so on. So they decided, you know, how, how can they get access to that because all products need to be updated. Uh, and if they could get access to the updates, then they can start launching their attacks through, the, through those uh, malware pieces and so on. Um, and that's exactly what they did, right? So they, they selected SolarWinds. Um, and by the way, if anybody is suffering from a, a lack of sleep, um, you can find the well-documented, um, uh, you know, technical details on the sunburst cyber breach, which is what it was termed at the time. Um, so I, I'd recommend you download that. There are probably 160 pages of really detailed stuff, and uh, you'll be counting sheep in no time when you when you uh, read that one, right? Um, so basically, they they use this as a, as a Trojan horse, right? So they they access the the SolarWinds environment. Um, you know, people believe it was up to 18 months. Uh, prior to the actual breach itself. So, you know, there were we working on a day-to-day -day basis, doing all, you know, selling our products and doing marketing and doing sales and doing product development and updates and all this kind of good stuff. Um, and we didn't, we had no idea that there was somebody uh, within our environments, right? Um, so, uh, so when they decided to um, uh, launch the, the malware, basically it was through the update servers. Um, people downloaded their latest updates, they ran the updates and that launched the pay payload into their environments. Um, so th th in a nutshell, that's essentially what they did. They used us as a middleman, as a Trojan horse to get into their targets. Um, obviously it was a very well kind of, it was in the news quite a lot. So, you know, uh, headline news uh, when, it, when it happened. Um, and, you know, I suppose one, one of the positives that came out of it was kind of identified after the fact that it wasn't as widespread as was initially feared. So initially they were saying 800 accounts had been compromised and breached. Um, I think at the end of the day, it was less than 80. Uh, accounts that actually had been breached uh, and so on. However, having said that, you know, the, the horse had bolted, right? So 
uh, you know, John and Marcel talked around vulnerabilities and not having the technologies to identify when somebody's in your network. And you know that was that was Solomon's at the time, right? They didn't have they didn't invest in the technologies to to make that breach uh, or to stop that breach happening. So uh, yeah, it was a tough tough time, tough eighteen months, as they say. <laughs> Yes, I can imagine. Thank you for sharing that, though, uh, JC. And uh, indeed, I, also, like we said before, I think we could talk about cyber attacks alone for days, if we even dissect the solar winds attack. Um, but I think in this sense, it's also important to shed some light on other important components in nation state attacks, which are the human and the physical ones. Uh, because we often see that these are intertwined with the cyber attack path. So. I'm actually interested to ask Marcel, as a, as a f uh, former intelligence officer, do you see that nation state actors uh, actually use tactics around human and physical aspects in combination with their cyber attacks? Well, uh, yeah, well, the short answer is, is yes. Um, sometimes we tend to overlook uh, other ways in which foreign intelligence agencies operate. So, for example, um, last year, a chemist working at Coca Cola. Uh, she applied for a program that was sponsored by a nation state uh, and eventually ended up giving away valuable intellectual property uh, to that foreign country, um, or at least to attempt to do that. And, and that, that the value of that trade secret was, was estimated about $120 million. Oh, wow. So, yeah, and then um, <laughs> that, that's a lot of money. And I think it's important to understand that, that cyber attacks, they, they definitely play a significant role when it comes to espionage. Um, but they are not the only methods used by nation states. And I would like to emphasize a little bit on that because uh, when I come to, uh, to, to organizations, they, they spend a lot of money on cybersecurity, which, which they should do that, uh, definitely, because the majority of attacks will be on, uh, on cyber. But I would hate to see organizations invest a lot of money and then see the IP walking through the back door because they didn't they, they didn't thought of of the human factor specifically when it comes to uh, what we call it uh, human operations. Mm -hmm. And and uh, when you look at intelligence operations, often a variety of tactics is used. So we talked about cyber attacks. I briefly talked a bit about recruiting spies because that that's what we're talking about. But at the same time, we see that uh, governments or intelligence agencies, that they are taking over companies or they work with bond companies. Uh, they are exploiting uh, uh, international uh, academic cooperation. They spread false information and, and they are running uh, political influence campaigns. And, and, and what, you, what you see now, and, that, and I, I completely agree with, oh, I can completely understand that, that this variety or this spectrum of, of uh, modus operandi that is being deployed at the same time is often difficult and very challenging for companies to, to defend against. Um, so yeah, yes, the human, human operations play, play a, dip, a significant part in, in intelligence operations, yes. Thank you, that indeed sounds very challenging. I think with every answer that we hear uh, from the panel, we can see that uh, the importance of protective measures is rising. So I think it's good that we're going to dive into that as well later. Um, but before we go into the how you can protect yourself and your organization uh, against nation state attacks, I promised you uh, all that we will go through a real life example next to the solar winds attack uh, and learn how everything we've already heard is applied in practice. So I would want to invite John to talk us through this example. Yeah, it's it's really useful to study these attacks in general, and, and this is kind of core to what what Vectra has done in, in terms of how we built things. And so, what what I'm going to talk you through right now is an example of an attack that our technology was able to detect. Um, we have kind of folks that that are able to go in and and actually were able to do the attribution in this case only after the fact. Um, and what's fundamentally kind of a thing worth highlighting is the things that you know we ended up Vectra detecting during this attack are the same things that this, in this case, nation state did or any other cyber attacker that's out there would do. So to level set, this is a, an attack that basically was targeting uh, a large uh, global 500 organization. What started the attack is something that is pretty traditional in terms of attackers kind of operations it started with effectively phishing. It started actually with targeted phishing over LinkedIn. 
uh, the employee of this organization was reached out to on LinkedIn and was basically solicited for a job. What they were able to do with the attackers was get the user to interact with them over WhatsApp uh, with a job description. Um, that job description actually contained information that eventually was uh, a payload that could drop off onto the actual laptop of this end user. Once that payload dropped, the attacker was able to deploy a, a remote control system basically onto that machine. Traditional attacker tactic, getting initial access through basically manipulating the user with social engineering and then deploying kind of a piece of malware that actually gives them the ability to then do remote control of that system. From there, it became a pretty standard set of tactics. The attacker was able to gain and access a set of credentials, which they were then able to use to look for data within the environment that they would want to collect. Their basically were goal here was to steal uh, intellectual property from this organization. Um, we can tell that based off of the types of information that they were searching against as they were doing reconnaissance. From there, they were trying to look for basically servers, which they can move to that contain high value IP. And what they were then able to do is with stolen credentials, start to move to higher value systems um, using basically privilege of use within the system. Again, credentials are central to attacks. I mentioned this before. We're finding that, you know, on average, 70% of attacks are going to involve an attack a credential, a stolen credential in them, just because fundamentally it allows the attacker to bypass any sort of kind of EDR that's in place. It allows attackers to basically bypass any sort of prevention because fundamentally anything a credential does, they're allowed to do. But this was able to get detected by kind of Vectra using Vectra's attack signal intelligence, it was able to highlight each of these stages of the attack and actually allowed basically this defender to see the, the threat and stop it before. I want to call out before can we move on here, you know, again, this was a case where prevention failed. Basically, the attacker was able to progress pretty far. We were able to detect their actions, but they were allowed to do a lot. And you can see on the bottom row here, everything from the web gateway to email security, AV, firewall, zero trust, all these things failed leading into this. And this is a pretty common occurrence we see in terms of these, these kind of threat actors, either nation state or just general attack gangs out there that are active. Um, and so really this to me is a good example of kind of where you know prevention can fail and, and that kind of proactive detection functionality can be central. All right, thank you, John. I think indeed very interesting to see such a yeah an often taken uh, attack path, um, and also how indeed prevention uh, uh, techniques are often evaded. Uh, I can imagine the audience might have a little bit of questions around the WhatsApp part because I think also when I heard it for the first time, I thought, isn't the EDR so the endpoint detection response supposed to take this into account? Uh, but can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, you know, it, it, it can be tricky, especially when we're starting to talk with people first interacting with kind of personal devices. You know, it can be easy for that to get in. And in a world where basically folks have, you know, personal devices accessing things, not every personal device can have access to the corporate EDR. And that can be the gateway then for an attacker to pivot in, access systems internally with credentials, then deploy systems there, malware that on systems that are vulnerable that can bypass EDR. EDR is really great. It, it helps. Never saying you know EDR isn't valuable as a prevention mechanism, but there's ways around it. I mean, these attack groups are highly, highly motivated to gain financial you know value from their attacks, and so they have the means to bypass EDR. No question. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So that means indeed that you see the attackers are using multiple tactics to get to their um, objective. It's also important for organizations to use multiple. Uh, mitigation uh, tactics, tactics to actually prevent such an attack to um, escalate. I think that's a, a nice conclusion from this one. I can imagine JC also seeing this attack path and uh, having through gone through the solar winds attack path, you might have something to add on the impact of such an attack. Yeah, yeah. So um, I suppose earlier I mentioned the fact that they were in the network for up to eighteen months. Uh, we were blissfully unaware, you know, going about our daily business. Um, so we and all of the all of the news articles and everything you know that, that was in the press was in terms of what the attacker was trying to achieve, what was their goal, what was their target, etc. Um, on the other side of the fence is the impact on the SolarWinds employees and the SolarWinds company, right? Um, so 
in, in a nutshell, I think the biggest impact that I kind of noticed was that essentially every business process stopped within the company within within 24 hours, right? So all selling stopped, all marketing stopped, right? Uh, any product development, any product updates, uh, all stopped. Um, and essentially people were focused into two things. Uh, anybody on the technical side of the fence in terms of product development, um, you know, development themselves and software development, um, SEs, et cetera, they were all focused on getting the fix out as fast as possible. So getting the patches done, getting that out to customers, getting the patches updated on the systems, uh, onto the platform, um, and try to make sure that um, the, you know, all the customers who had the platform uh, would be would be covered. Um, and in fairness to the company, they did that very, very rapidly. Um, I think within 48 hours, the initial patch was out and then there's a number of subsequent patches that came out following that. Um, on the other side of the coin, um, everybody else in the organization you know sales marketing and you know the executive staff everybody was focused heavily on customer retention right so the question was you know how can we make sure we retain the customers we already have because obviously this is all over the news big reputational impact you know big financial impact etc and um, but how could we how could we retain the customers um, and then when it when it came down to it i think there was kind of two things that essentially um, helped the organization overcome the, the challenge, you know, and it went on for an extended time, you know, the, the whole process of, you know, getting the patches out, retaining customers went down for a good 12 months, if not more. Um, and probably still some remnants of that going on today, right? Um, but the two things I think that really helped uh, SolarWinds was one was great products. I mentioned earlier on that, you know, their, their network monitoring tool is ubiquitous across many organizations. So they had a very loyal following. A lot of the practitioners in the marketplace who use those products uh, were very loyal to it and they wanted to keep using it and customers and partners jumped on board very quickly to try and help us they said hey how can we help to get through this right um and then the other thing of course was the culture within the company there was a huge kind of um culture of you know one team and camaraderie everybody was you know you know rolling up their sleeves getting things done getting out to customers the exec team are traveling around the world meeting customers um as well so those two things i really um you know think helped the, the organization get through uh, that that attack. Um, I suppose the good news now is that they have a secure by design philosophy across all of their software development, um, and you know the Solwind software is probably the safest software in the world today. <laughs> um, so all of that came from it. All right, thank you, JC, for adding that, and I think also a good example of how the human aspect is also important in uh, recovering uh, uh, from an attack. Oh, huge! I mean, massive, yeah. massive influence on it. Yeah, yeah. Good to hear that from. Uh, from a real life example, so thank you. I think now we've heard about who the attackers are, why they attack you, and, and in what ways they can attack you, uh, also from a real life example. So I think we can go on to the probably most important topic for today, which is how can you mitigate the risk that they pose? So uh, John, also speaking from your technical background, can you explain to us what you see as an important measure to take to countering these attacks? So there's definitely the table stakes stuff. Um, you know, there there is things that you should do on a prevention front. If you do nothing in terms of prevention, it, it, it's obviously uh, a risk. So things like well-configured firewalls and proxies, MFA on identities is absolutely, absolutely critical in terms of being able to stop that with, with tightly built kind of conditional access policies for the cloud, robust patching as much as you can. Um, that's a really hard thing and least privileged, like the, those kind of table stakes security prevention measures are definitely essential. They're continue to be essential. They're really critical to have that first wall to really knock out kind of the, the super opportunistic attacks and even opportunistic nation states that are out there doing these attacks. But after that fact, once kind of you, you've looked at that, it's incremental gains to keep focusing on prevention, to keep trying to manage posture, to keep doing those things. It, it, it only can get you so far. And that's where there's a mentality of, of kind of looking at the fact that, okay, we've got the prevention in place, the best effort prevention. Are we certain that if someone got past the prevention, we would know if the attack was happening? Are we able to sit here and say, assuming that we were compromised, are we confident that we can see an attack? Do we have the log somewhere that would show us? Do we have alerting somewhere that shows the attacker is there? Would we be able to respond in time to stop an attack if it got past our prevention? Because you can keep going after prevention, but it's only one kink 
in that chain that an attacker needs to find and they will find it and they're in and you need to make sure that once they're in there's the visibility to the things they do next a great way to do this in terms of kind of defensive posture around this is to actively be doing red teams in your organization and not just red teams from the outside you know phishing exercises against employees or kind of type of red team you know probing your firewall for vulnerabilities it's a type but really the core red team exercise that organizations should make sure they're doing are the assumed compromise ones. Give a professional red teamer access to Azure AD credentials and say, what can we see if the attacker got access to them? Give them a, a system in the environment with a C2 channel running from it and say, can we see the C2? Can we see the progression, the discovery, the lateral movement? Ask your team those questions because it's central to really knowing, you know, hey, if we were compromised, we can see it. Yeah, yeah, good point. I think visibility is definitely something very important also in that sense. Um, and uh, the red teaming, I think, is also interesting, right? We see this a lot also in these regulations that come up, like uh, in Europe, we have the DORA, the financial sector, and this too. Uh, for critical infrastructure, these also often include red team exercising. Uh, so I think that's an interesting aspect uh, that these regulations also sort of provide a nudge in the right direction. Um, so what I would like to discuss next is also in terms of mitigating the risk. Um, if we look at the audience that we have today, there are a lot of international or multinational organizations that operate across nations, so also across potentially adversarial nation state threat actors. So Marcel, can you tell us a little bit about how you would tackle the mitigation measures in that international operating atmosphere? Oh, yeah, that, that's that, that's a really good question, uh, uh, Marta. Uh, it's a quite challenging and broad asking. question. Uh, yeah, I know, I know, that, and that's that's fine. Uh, uh, that's great. Uh, it, us it usually requires a bit more uh, conversation with the company, at least to uh, uh, better understand their landscape. But um, a, a few things in the right direction would be, uh, as, as John mentioned before, uh, first off, enhance your cybersecurity measure. So I will not dive too into that again. Uh, but at the same time, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, I see a lot of companies uh, uh, um, spending a lot of money on the cybersecurity uh, program, which is excellent, uh, but also uh, consider uh, an insider risk program uh, specifically to address the threats from within your organization. And that could be as associated with your employees, uh, contractors, uh, partners uh, who intentionally or unintentionally uh, misuse their privileges. Um, we, we agreed upon uh, not uh, st stating any nation state names, but mm -hmm. when I look to the Netherlands as an example, uh, when it comes to human operations, so, so the recruitment of spies within uh, a corporate by intelligence agencies, uh, a certain country, uh, in the last five years, just in the Netherlands alone, uh, the Dutch government expelled almost 40 uh, spies from that only that specific nation and and the, uh, uh, Europe expelled about 300 of those spies uh, back to their to their own nation so the, so 40 spies in the Netherlands I, I mean the Netherlands is just this big and uh, um, it, it's extensive and I think there's a, a a handler or human operator as we call it as well uh, he or she has multiple sources uh, than just one so th this this is uh, quite big and, and we see that it can uh, damage your uh, organization uh, a lot actually yeah, um, I can imagine. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so another thing is uh, consider your third parties eh? uh, uh, most companies already do the di due diligence on potential partners eh? the, the, including assessing their reputation the, the track record uh, and also the commitment on their intellectual property um, but at the same time, I, th th there's a lot of companies, and, and I completely understand that, but they are not aware that some uh, third parties must comply with foreign intelligence laws. And, and this could mean that this company that is abroad uh, needs to hand over your trade secrets if their respective government requests uh, this. Uh, this could very well be the case, uh, specifically if this, this is an IT department abroad or a startup uh, that is operating in a certain country. Um, so what else? Um, oh, Ford is a, a, a provide specialized training to, to key employees. 
uh, and uh, I mean then the employees who play a critical role in preserving your competitive competitive advantage. So, for example, um, the concept car designers in the automotive industry, or innovation uh, engineers in the technology sen uh, sector, you can think of your research engineers in disease treatment, of your procurement officers in defense industries. All these people play a significant uh, and vital role within your company. And um, I'm not th talking about awareness campaigns, because if, if you're facing nation states, I think you should move from awareness campaigns towards understanding programs. So uh, train these uh, employees that, that play these vital roles, uh, how foreign intelligence agencies actually operate and how they can become a target. And so, so make them aware, of course, but also help them understand and maybe even experience uh, to what degree they are a valuable target for uh, uh, these intelligence agencies. because. A first human approach on LinkedIn, like John mentioned, that, that happens quite a lot. Uh, but it also can happen when people are traveling abroad. Um, and, and, and these people are actually very valuable assets in, in, uh, in identifying, defending, and responding, uh, responding to, to uh, espionage operations within your own company. So why not at the same time help them uh, educate uh, on what's, what's what when it comes to these operations? Yeah. Um, well, in addition, I put uh, put the folder as an attachment uh, for for your information as well. Yeah, the folder on on travel security training. I think indeed a very valid point. I think that lately in the news you also see a lot of examples where people were also unaware of being recruited as a spy by a foreign nation state. Right. So it's good to indeed yeah. create that really understanding instead of only awareness uh, among your organization and your employees. Um, so yeah. with that said, so, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah, just just to add because I I, I glanced a bit to the Q and A for some people are asking for references. So what is an excellent article is uh, from the New York Times. It's called the Ru the Ruse of a Spy. Uh, that elaborates very well how how you can uh, fall into this trap. And this was also a very key employee within an organization that uh, that became targeted. All right, great. Uh, thank you, Marcel, for already answering a question. That's uh... And that's awesome. I also read an article, and it's indeed a highly recommended uh, article to read. So uh, a good one to start on after the webinar. Uh, so with that said, I think we've heard a lot of good actions to really get started on defending your organizations against, against nation state threats. But for our final topic, we want to help you how to actually start, because that's probably the hard step, right? Where do you start? So uh, we have a highly experienced panel here. So I would like to ask uh, each gentleman um, to explain what he thinks is the most important step or activity or question to start with for organizations to incorporate the nation state threat into their cybersecurity strategy and approach. Um, so Marcel, you were on a roll. Can you maybe start? <laughs> sure. Uh, so for, uh, well, for a solid strategy and approach, at least to start, um, so first off, this this whole nation state threat, this is about preserving your competitive advantage. At least I, I'm talking now to the audience. It is, it is about preserving your competitive advantage, uh, specifically in this this threat landscape. And I think when uh, uh, what a lot of companies do, they, they want to expand their business in a country that that has an uh, offensive intelligence capability. And and if that's the case, it, it will be even more, more relevant to think about uh, about this. Uh, because we know that nation states are stealing trade secrets, or as 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 JC mentioned, they can misuse your company as, as a stepping stone, uh, and, and they do that in a variety of ways. And it can either severely damage your business, as in JC's uh, case, but it it, it can also uh, kill your business. Um, and that that means that companies must no longer be just aware of the threat, but they need to accept that this is an actual threat. And it can very well happen to your organization as well. And it should be therefore discussed actually in the boardroom. So so where to start? Because I, I speak to a lot of uh, CISOs that, that have a difficulty to, to get that speaking time at the boardroom. Uh, and and what, uh, you, you asked, what do you do? Eh? What does uh, KPMG do? Uh, so this is one example. Uh, first off, understand how this threat landscape specifically will apply to your organization's core business. So which threat scenarios will be specifically relevant to you? 
And then consider the various ways that nation states um, uh, yeah, can exploit that. Well, that could be uh, cyber attacks. Take please in, into consideration human, the human factor operations and third party aspects that, that, that will, uh, they will exploit to, to reach their own specific uh, strategic goals. Uh, once you know that, then look at how effective your security capabilities are against that, all these kind of threats at the moment. Uh, how do you know that today your employees are not selling trade secrets or that a third party is not handing over its information to a local inspector abroad or that an APT is hacking in your core systems? Uh, so, so once you know those, you, you know the threat and you know the, the your resilience and then if you hold those together and you see the light shining through, uh, quantify that gap and try to quantify that in potential financial loss, uh, which is the impact on your organization. And, and compare that to your the actual value of your trade secrets. And, yeah. and truthfully, that is a very, very hard exercise. Uh, but if you, if you do that, it, it will actually help you in the cost benefits discussion that many CISO and ESOs have with the CFO and eventually will help you prioritize your security program. Uh, yeah. It matters where, where, where to invest, but also how much to invest. And it basically answers the question, when is good good enough? How much do you want to expand, of, uh, spend and what still makes sense? Uh, in general, it's, it's a more efficient way to reduce risk exposure and, and at the same time create a security program that, that will uh, improve your defense in a more holistic and, and balanced manner. And uh, uh, you asked before, what, what do I do? Well, if you need help or want to explore this further, uh, please let me know, I'm, I'm very happy to help. All right, thank you. I think I need a lot of good points and questions to start with. Also, uh, considering time, we'll move on to JC. Also looking forward to your, your input. Are you on mute, JC? Because we cannot hear you. Sorry, I was coughing <laughs> earlier. So yes, I was. <laughs> okay. um, so yeah, so basically, uh, it's not easy. Um, you know, where do you begin to take on this um, large task of securing your entire enterprise against any type of cyber attack? Um, my, you know, when I look at the SolarWinds attack, I look at where they compromised us. You know, there was people's identity, there was administrator passwords compromised, there was cloud services compromised, there was development servers compromised, product update software code was compromised, and and so on. So um I, th I think you know any organization um really should be undertaking like risk assessments on a regular basis um and my recommendation in that regard would be to have a third party to do it i, th I think internalize you know ait teams and security teams are really busy anyway right um you know there's a lot of data to, to support the fact that they're kind of uh, overburdened as it is um and i think having a, a fresh set of eyes on on the environment is good um and I agree entirely with Marcel that it, this should be a boardroom conversation on a regular basis, a quarterly basis, with uh, the CEO and the chairman and the board members saying, where are we on this kind of risk, you know, risk scale? You know, what's, our, what's our gaps, et cetera? So I think that would be, if I was the CEO of a company, that's, that's what I would do. Um, on another point, I suppose, you know, I'm with Vector now, and I'd be fairly confident that if, if SolarWinds had Vector AI in their, in their environment, the attack wouldn't have happened. And so that, that's another thing people can consider about having a technology that can detect unknown threats within environments as well. All right, thank you. Very valid points to add. So also for you, John, I know we're tight on time, but can you give your most important additions to what has already been shared? Yeah, I, I can be quick because I think I've said it a few times. I think the, the fundamental question that you should ask that, that is helpful in this is, is a really high level question is, do we know if an attacker is active in our, our, our environment? Answering that question or having that thought exercise, I think, is one of the top things people can do to stop these basically threat actors, nation state or otherwise, is having that thought exercise play out in the room, play out in the boardroom, understand, do we know, and getting that as a, a confident answer that the team can say and really communicate strongly. <laughs> All right, thank you. I think that summarizes very well indeed. I hear a lot of really assessing your organization, knowing what you're already doing and where maybe your vulnerabilities lie or your risks, and then really tying into where, where are my gaps and what should I do to really um, tackle that. Uh, so thank you all for, for the input here. Uh, with that, we actually almost reached the end of the webinar, and I think we've already heard a lot about all of the different topics discussed. 
Um, so I think before we dive into the uh, Q&A, a quick recap, I think, of what we've heard from our panel last 50 minutes. Um, first of all, accept the fact that nation state actors are out there and that they are motivated to target your organization. I think we've discussed it a lot. Um, and that you can also be targeted uh, maybe as a stepping stone or another party can be targeted as a stepping stone to you through these supply chain attacks. Secondly, uh, I think, uh, John, you explained it very well. Uh, prevention 100% is impossible. So just know that it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when and just make sure that you then are able to detect it quickly after and mitigate the attack path after initial access. And finally, make good connection between your technical measures. Oh, oh no, it's it's like 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 oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> Martin's been hacked. <laughs> Martin's being hacked. Um, as we as we wait, actually, I was just to get the Q and A. We can let's jump into a couple of questions there. Um, I'll I'll take over here for a second. Um, so there was one question on a. Can I share the sleeping book or document reference? Um, yes, we can do that. I was actually searching through. There's a a document from Mandiant uh, who actually went into the sunburst uh, in great detail. So uh, we can try and get you that link um, to put you to sleep on it. Um, there was a question from Herman. Uh, so nation state attacks on IT. And OT systems are two different two different types of cyber attacks um, with different objectives, targets, methods. What are the most important differences between nation state attacks on IT and OT? OT? So, Marcel, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, and, um, um, due to time, it's, it, I, I um, got thirty seconds. Yeah, thirty <laughs> seconds. First of all, uh, uh, there will be a, a security event at Fenord. Uh, that's uh, that's a big uh, Dutch company. Is that's on the 14th of September? If you have questions on this, I would like to invite you to come over there. If you have the possibility, if you're in the Netherlands, please reach out. Then we can discuss this uh, more specific. If if that that is what you open for. But in general, um, uh, IT is mostly on on in, well at least OT is on the disruption of availability. And we see that uh, in, in that particular manner that uh, uh, it can be either ransomware or, or, or an, uh, a different kind of attack. But what most important is, is now is that on a geopolitical level, we see that the intention of sabotage towards retaliation specifically on OT system is uh, that's increasing insanely. In the Netherlands, we now see uh, foreign ships at these big data cables between the Netherlands and the UK. That is being uh, re re well. There's a lot of reconnaissance on that from foreign nations. Um, so you see that the attacks are increasing, the intent is increasing, and we see that the activities are increasing, all specifically tied into the uh, disruption of the availability of these services. And uh, that's specifically on on IT. Um, in IT, is I think that John uh, mentioned a lot about uh, these different uh, 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 aspects. Uh, uh, that could also be a disruption of uh, availability, but uh, uh, also very much on, on the theft of intellectual property. Yeah. I, I hope that I answered your question with that. Just, just to jump yeah, in well, here. Sorry, go ahead, from, John. From another perspective, just to jump in here. Fundamentally, uh, you know, an OT attack, an attacker can't just suddenly, you know, teleport themselves to, to the OT systems in an environment. So fundamentally, every OT attack that we've tracked and that are documented start as an IT attack. You have to get into the environment, you have to get credentials, you have to navigate your way through. So having IT coverage is still essential. OT is the last leg. Really, you want to be detecting an attack against your OT in your IT before the attacker gets to their end stage. Cool, yeah, and um, I, I think we're, Fail well out of time, Martha. You kind of dropped yeah. off there, so I just yeah, went through the Q and A. Thank yeah, no worries. Um, we, we were wondering if your system got hacked there and you got taken out. Yeah. There you go. I also um, don't know what happened, but um, I'm glad I'm back. Um, thank you, uh, JC, for taking that on. I think it did in the sake of time. I'm not sure if this question yeah. was already answered, but yes, this webinar is recorded. It will be um, available on demand uh, afterwards, uh, so you can always uh, revisit the entire uh, webinar. And then for the final, I think uh, we already touched upon some stuff, but we have some useful assets in the download panel of uh, your interface, um, also about NIST 2 uh, and the travel security awareness course that uh, Marcel was talking about. 
And then I already heard something about the Van Oort event. So upcoming events we have that might be interesting to follow up on this webinar are the threat detection and response um, blue team workshops from Vector AI, uh, which you can still register for. And on the 14th of September, we indeed have a live event at Van Oort here in Rotterdam. Uh, so please feel free to contact us uh, if you're interested in joining this. Um, and um, we'd like to thank you all for being here, for asking your questions, and we hope to see you at the next event. And of course, thank panelists, you. thanks a lot for your attendance, for your very valuable information. And um, yeah, have a great uh, rest of your day, everyone. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.